So I'm Maureen Brooks, and um, I'm really excited to be here today to tell you about some of the work that uh, I've been doing over the last year as a Blue Waters graduate fellow. Um, and so the scale and scope of my talk is pretty big change from what uh, was going on in this session this morning. Um, but I'm an oceanographer by trade, and so Blue Waters is sort of my natural habitat. So, um, so I'm going to tell you about some work that I've done looking at an organism called sargassum. And sargassum is uh, a type of macroalgae or seaweed. And the species that I study are unique in the world's oceans because they're the only ones that spend their whole life floating on the ocean surface. And the mats that sargassum forms as it floats around um, are involved in nutrient cycling. In the areas of the ocean where sargassum is found, the nutrient qualities are pretty low. Um, there's low amount of ambient nutrients. And so one of the things that sargassum does is it hosts um, smaller uh, phytoplankton that end up fixing atmospheric nitrogen into a form that's more biologically available. And the other, uh, Another nutrient-related aspect of sargassum is it has a high carbon content, high carbon to chlorophyll ratio. And so it's been observed decaying on the seafloor. And so when it sinks, it may be an important source of carbon export. But in addition to nutrient cycling, sargassum is also really critical habitat. So um, there's some species like the sargassum fish here that are endemic to sargassum, so they're only really found associated with these mats that are floating. Um, species like juvenile sea turtles uh, have been seen using sargassum as a sort of nursery habitat. And there's a much higher fish abundance in and around these mats of sargassum. And so not only is that habitat for those fish, but also those fish act as forage for commercial species like tuna. So all of these things are reasons why it's really important to get a handle on the distribution of sargassum in the Atlantic. And just to orient you a little bit, again, because the scale of what I'm looking at is pretty different um, from some other folks today, um, this is my research domain. And this is the only place in the world where sargassum is found. And in particular, um, sargassum is really uh, important in the Gulf of Mexico and the Sargasso Sea. And so now we're going to take a look at some observations of sargassum. So it's only really been in maybe the last 10 years or so that we've been able to observe this seasonal distribution of sargassum from satellites. So these are climatologies that are derived from Maris satellite chlorophyll imagery. And I'm just going to step you through them. So the darker green colors are higher sargassum biomass. And I sort of think of the sargassum annual cycle starting in the spring. Um, and there starts to be some development of sargassum biomass in the western Gulf of Mexico um, here. And the population in the rest of the Atlantic is sort of diminishing at that time. And as we get into the summer, the whole Gulf of Mexico is full of sargassum. And there's a lot of sargassum here in the tropics as well. In the fall, that those large populations have now decreased again, and there's this additional population at the northern extent to the Sargasso Sea. And finally, in the wintertime, um, there's really just this one main remnant population that's sort of hanging out in the central Sargasso Sea. And so I really want to understand what forces are contributing to give us this distribution of Sargassum year after year. And to answer this question, I've taken a coupled modeling approach. So I've coupled an a ocean circulation physical model, a biogeochemical model, and a Lagrangian particle model. And I'm going to walk you through each of them. So the physics model, uh, I've chosen HICOM, the hybrid coordinate ocean model. And I've generated this domain for the Atlantic at a 1 12th degree, or roughly a little less than 10 kilometer resolution. Um, and each of these tiny little boxes on this figure are actually 10 by 10 uh, grid cells in my model. And so that's over 1.8 million grid cells. And each of those has 28 vertical layers. And I've ended up partitioning these um, into quite a few uh, equal area tiles. So I tried a pretty modest domain decomposition when I started running this model on Blue Waters. 
and ran into some memory issues. And so by um, doing a, a bit more partitioning, I'm running on 128 nodes, and it works quite well. Um, and so this is accounting for the temperature, the salinity, the density, and the velocities. And now I've coupled to that a biogeochemical model. And so this is really to get information about the nutrient conditions in the water. And so um, this is a model that I've written that's based on a previously existing um, bio biogeochemical model um, written by Katja Fennel. And it has 10 state variables. So there's three different plankton functional groups, um, including that nitrogen fixation that I mentioned earlier, um, three nutrient pools, and, and two different detrital pools that um, help me keep track of the nutrient remineralization. And then the third model here is the Lagrangian particle model, and that's packaged with HICOM. Um, and there's a one-way coupling that affects these particles based on the velocities from the HICOM physics. And I've added a positive buoyancy to these particles to simulate the floating sargassum. And so it lets these particles move as fully 3D particles. They're not forced to be at the surface, but they have a high buoyancy. Um, and so some of my typical initializations include about 50,000 particles. And, and the nice thing about this particle model is that um, it can be run both online as HICOM is running, but it can also be run post-fact using output from HICOM. And, and the nice thing that le that lets me do um, is that I can run my particles forward or backward in time without having to rerun the whole coupled model system. And so I'm going to start off with some of the physics and work my way up in complexity here. So some previous work that I had done, um, just looking at random distributions of particles in the Atlantic in a coarse resolution model, showed that particles after you know, an annual time scale tend to aggregate in the center of the subtropical gyre. And that's not really what we want to see when we're thinking about sargassum. Um, but it, it does a pretty good job of capturing the plastic distribution. Um, so not so good for sargassum. So um, when I move to the higher 1 12th degree resolution that I'm running out on blue waters, um, I'm hoping to capture more of the eddy activity. And it's reasonable to think that you know, mesoscale features like eddies and fronts might help disperse the sargassum out of the gyre. Um, but what I found is that even though the particles end up more dispersed than they are in a coarse resolution model, um, it's still not really enough to generate that annual sargassum distribution, and that they're still really just collecting in the gyre. And so finally, um, I also try to initialize my particles based on those sargassum satellite observations. And so in each month, I initialize my particles only in places where sargassum was found. And when I do that, the particles still end up collecting in the gyre. It's a slightly different distribution, but it's still not what we want to see for a sargassum distribution. So it seems like physical processes alone are just not enough to capture um, what's going on in the dynamics of these species. So that's good. I'm a biologist. I want the biology to be important. Um, so next, I looked at just smaller time scales. And so this is initializing particles based on observations and just tracking them for two months. And I just want to get a handle on how important the physics are. Um, and, it, and it turns out that um, it's actually pretty variable across the year. So this black line on the right here is the percent match between the observations and my particles. And it can get between a 30 and a 60% match, and it varies seasonally. Um, and physics seems to be more important at times of year when um, we would expect the biology to be less important. So at times when there's a stratified water column, um, when nutrients might be less available, when temperatures might not be optimal. So th then I start thinking about the physiology of the sargassum. And I just, um, in this figure, it's identical to the previous one, but I've just colored the particles in blue. Um, that are in conditions of light or temperature that are suboptimal for sargassum growth. And so when I do that, again, you can see I get a pretty uh, nice increase in the match percent, but only in the wintertime when the physical control is weak. So I can get an annual average of about 40% match with observations just by doing this crude accounting. Um, but that's still not really what I want to see, and it, it doesn't give me enough information to generate 
the whole seasonal pattern. And so I have these three coupled models, and they're great, but they're not enough. And so it's time to add a fourth coupled model. Uh, why not? Um, so the next thing that I did was I developed a sargassum individual base model. And this model is run in each of those Lagrangian particles as they're vected. And this accounts for light and temperature and nutrient conditions. And so there's an age-based mortality term, and, and it accounts for sargassum sinking as it dies. And when I apply this model to my random initial distribution, this is what I end up with. So this is looking at an annual cycle of these particles, and I only have one year to look at here. Um, and the contours that I plotted here are contours from those satellite observations. And so we can see kind of qualitatively that um, I can actually increase the abundance of sargassum in the regions where we observe sargassum. And I, I'm also sort of killing off the sargassum in places where we're not observing it. So qualitatively, it looks like we're doing a reasonable job here. And when I quantify that, you can see that I get a much nicer increase in my match percent with the observations. So now I can get about a 70% match over the course of the year with the observations. And more importantly, it's consistent throughout the year. So it, that tells me that I'm doing a good job of actually capturing that annual cycle. So now that I have a model that seems to be capturing what's going on, um, now I want to start zooming in and thinking about regions in this domain where sargassum um, might be more important, or regions that might have a disproportionate influence on the overall distribution of sargassum. And so to try to tackle this, um, I did a connectivity analysis. And so what I've done here is I just subdivided my domain into these 12 regions, and they're chosen based either on the oceanographic properties um, of the circulation there, or because they're particularly important or interesting in the sargassum distribution. And I in, uh, densely initialized particles in those regions and then just tracked where they ended up at different time scales. And so in this matrix, um, the x-axis is the, the source regions um, by numbered according to this figure. And the y-axis are the receiving regions. So after 90 days, um, particles start in the source region, end up in the receiving region. Um, and they're colored by the percent of particles so it's all normalized to the number of particles that were initialized in a given subregion. And so um, the diagonal here is retention within a region. And just for some examples, um, so the Amazon plume region here is a really active region um, for transport. And if we look at that as a source region here, we can see that it's exporting more particles than it retains at a three month time scale. Whereas the central Sargasso Sea is a really convergent region. We know that our inert particles are converging there. And at three month time scales, over 85% of the particles that start there are still there. But something interesting that popped out of this um, is when I looked at the Gulf of Mexico. And so that's regions one and two here. Region one is the Western Gulf of Mexico. And 40% of the particles that I initialized there are retained there at a three month time scale. Whereas right next door in the Eastern Gulf, uh, only 15% of the particles remain there at a three month time scale. So this is really intriguing. And it got me thinking about not only regions that might have disproportionate influence on the, on the sargassum distribution, but a region where sargassum is retained, but where we know that there's a lot of sargassum seasonally could potentially be a seed region. Um, for sargassum across the domain. And now I'm just looking um, quickly also at a six month retention. So um, this is a, the start month along the x axis and the percent of particles that are retained in that region um, after six months. And again, you can see that the Sargasso Sea, both the central Sargasso and the southwestern Sargasso Sea, are highly retentive. Um, and we have this big discrepancy still between the eastern and the western Gulf of Mexico. So I wanted to find out whether um, coherent structures like eddies, 
we're responsible or we're influencing this difference um, between the Eastern and the Western Gulf. And so I conducted a Lagrangian coherent structure analysis. And um, I'm just gonna give a really brief synopsis of this. Um, but basically, I initialize particles on a very dense grid and measure how much they disperse on a 21-day integration time. And that's running particles both forward and backward for 21 days. And that lets me calculate the, um, the exponential rate that those particles move apart from each other um, helps me define these Lagrangian coherent structures. And so in the next figure, you'll see lines like these. Um, the red lines are repelling Lagrangian coherent structures, and the blue ones are attracting. And so here's uh, that figure for the Gulf of Mexico. This is uh, for model day May 10th. And you can see that the western Gulf of Mexico is pretty quiescent. It has a lot lower eddy activity than the, the eastern Gulf of Mexico. Um, and the important thing to know about these Lagrangian coherent structures is that they act as pretty effective barriers to particle transport. And so this analysis suggests that this eddy activity in the eastern Gulf associated with the loop current there um, may be acting as a barrier to particle transport from the western Gulf of Mexico out to the Sargasso Sea. And so this does lend some credence to the hypothesis that um, the western Gulf of Mexico may be a seed region for sargassum. And so the ongoing work that I want to do with this, this is pretty um, preliminary. Um, and so what I'd like to do here is look at the biology across these structures to see whether the eddies themselves are actually influencing the sargassum growth. Because we know that eddies change the vertical velocities, and those vertical velocities influence the amount of nutrients that are available. So I'd like to do that for this region. I'd like to repeat that um, over the course of the year. And I'd also like to take a look at a couple other um, interesting regions that popped out from that connectivity analysis. So just to sum up, you know, physics alone is not enough to help us uh, recreate this distribution of this organism, that we really do need biology to understand the biology. Um, and so the sargassum growth model that I wrote um, really helps me capture the dynamics of the sargassum distribution year round. And that it looks like analysis of connectivity and eddy activity has highlighted the Gulf of Mexico as a potential seed region, I mean, particularly the Western Gulf, as a seed region for sargassum. And this, just, this photo from a colleague of mine in Puerto Rico um, just highlights that, you know, sargassum is great when it's out at sea, but it washes up on beaches. Um, and it costs millions of dollars to clean this up. No one wants to go on vacation when the beach looks like this. Um, and so it's my hope that um, this kind of work can help us understand what's causing these wash-ups, maybe help better forecast them. So with that, um, I'd really like to thank the Blue Waters team. It's been a great opportunity um, to have this fellowship. I'd especially like to thank um, my advisor, Victoria Coles, um, and Tom Cortese, who was my point of contact, who really helped me get uh, HICOM up and running on Blue Waters. So, thank you.